the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Disputes over ultra-Orthodox service in the Israeli army threatened to tear the government apart. This major league first baseman talks about his Jewish heritage. Israeli theater invades the U.S. And more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The issue of ultra-Orthodox men serving in the Israeli army has generated large controversies this week, including a threat to end the current government of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. First, in a ceremony on Sunday, more than 100 ultra-Orthodox men were sworn in as Israeli army recruits. Amid threats, the swearing-in would be disrupted by other ultra-Orthodox. The ceremony had originally been moved from a public location to a closed-off army base. But the recruits themselves pushed for a more public recognition of what they were doing despite the threats, and the ceremony was moved back to the traditional location for such events, Ammunition Hill, Israel's memorial to the Six-Day War. Large deployments of police and border guard forces seem to have had the effect of keeping any threats from turning into an actual disruption. But it's the drafting, not simply recruiting, of future ultra-Orthodox soldiers that is threatening to end the just-installed government in Israel. Israel's Knesset is attempting to finally resolve the issue of how to draft the ultra-Orthodox into military and national service after many years of dispute and delay. The issue has become particularly urgent for the Knesset as the Israeli Supreme Court in 2012 demanded an equitable replacement to the so-called Tall Law, which exempted ultra-Orthodox men from army service. The Supreme Court declared that approach unconstitutional. The assembling of the current Israeli coalition government by Netanyahu this year turned in large part on this question of precisely what to do about an ultra-Orthodox draft. Ultra-Orthodox parties were notably excluded from the government, and the second and third largest parties formed a pact based on this issue. Now, a dispute over the penalties for ultra-Orthodox avoiding conscription could make that coalition fail. In a vote over the issue of whether or not to arrest ultra-Orthodox who failed to respond to draft notices, Netanyahu's Likud Beitenu party surprised many by voting against that level of penalty. The leader of the government's second largest party, Finance Minister Yair Lapid of the Yesh Atid party, is saying the government won't continue if the penalties for ultra-Orthodox avoiding conscription are not the same as for other Israeli Jews. He wrote in a post on Facebook in Hebrew, I want to be very clear regarding an equal burden. There will be an equal burden for the ultra-Orthodox or this government will dissolve. There is an historical opportunity to fix a bleeding wound that is in the heart of Israeli society. Whoever utilizes this opportunity to create political gains are sinning against the nation of Israel and committing an offense against Zionism, an offense against the IDF, and an offense against every young Israeli who ever once entered an induction center. Meantime, the ultra-Orthodox effort to draft the ultra-Orthodox is taking hits from both sides. On one side, there are statements like that of ultra-Orthodox member of Knesset Rabbi Meir Perush, who declared that a bill designed to draft any ultra-Orthodox is, quote, designed to crush the world of Torah. But those seeking a bill that would draft all ultra-Orthodox, instead of exempting nearly a quarter of ultra-Orthodox men from service every year, are critical of proposed legislation as well, after Israel's Supreme Court seemed to rule last year that any blanket draft exemptions would violate Israel's constitution. Moving on, when Nate Fryman was drafted in 2009, it was for something else entirely. Fryman was a Duke University graduate taken in the eighth round in the Major League Baseball draft. While a minor leaguer, he played for the Israeli national baseball team last year in the 2013 World Baseball Classic qualifying competition. In recent weeks, he's been playing his major league rookie year at first base for the Oakland Athletics, and Meredith Gansman caught up with him to talk about it. In 1903, a concerned Jewish father wrote to the Jewish Daily Forward's advice column, the Bintel Briefs, What's the point of a crazy game like baseball? The forwards editor and founder, Abe Kahan, responded, The game of baseball is the perfect way to give Jewish boys a link to their fellow countrymen. 110 years later, America's pastime seems to be American Jews' favorite game as well. From the stands and on the field, from legends like Sandy Koufax to rookies like the Oakland A's Nate Fryman. It's important to represent. But why are Jews so connected with baseball? A panel at the 92Y recently assembled to answer this question. Is it statistics? Is it because there's no clock? Uh, you know, is it because uh, we'd like uh, 
to be uh, members of a tribe like we were during the Exodus. Larry Rutman is the author of American Jews and America's Game. He was joined by former Major League Baseball player Bob Tufts. Tufts converted to Judaism in 1980 while playing for the San Francisco Giants. I kept it fairly close to the vest. There was a reporter, Ken Liker, for the Arizona Republic, who basically, when I mentioned something, kind of looked at me and go, are you Jewish? And I go, no, but I'm converting. And he started to write, and I said, I am in a un very unstable situation right now. I do not know how my manager, Frank Robinson, will ask or the other players will act. I've kept it quiet for now. Once I have finished the conversion process, I will be more open with people or just about to. And he respected my wishes. Were you afraid of how people would react? Uh, having yes, because her. I played with a lot of people who lived in towns that didn't have sidewalks, who believed the Procter & Gamble people were Satanists, who believed Jews had horns on their head. As a matter of fact, I'll tell the story tonight if I have a chance, my wife met one of these women whose, father play, whose husband played in the majors and whose son also did, who when she found out she was Jewish, stared up and started pointing at the top of her head. And she went, what's the matter? And she's brushing something. You don't have horns. And I'm going, okay, this is someone from nowhere, Oklahoma, saying, what's going on here? And she said, I can't offend, I can't cause problems for my husband. She said, oh, I had plastic surgery and had them removed. And she nodded and went, oh, okay, fine. Today, Jews are much more accepted in Major League Baseball. There are only a handful of Jewish Major League Baseball players. Nate Fryman is one of them. Boston native Nate Fryman is a rookie first baseman for the Oakland A's. He majored in history and minored in math at Duke University, but this six foot, eight inch tall, nice Jewish boy had big league dreams. It was no question. It was what I've always wanted to be. Coming to Fenway Park as a five, six year old looking out, said, man, I want to play here someday. And that's what I've always wanted to do is play baseball. and play it for as long as possible. Fryman is proud to continue the legacy of Jews playing Major League Baseball, which began almost a century ago. There have been some, some great Jewish baseball players going back to, you know, Hank, Hank Greenberg, who he, he had some amazing numbers and he has a similar, he was a really tall guy uh, like me, so it, it got some good history. To see more from how the Jewish heritage of America's pastime continues to evolve, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, Israel's Gesher Theater is doing some performances stateside, as Meredith Gansman reports. The Gesher Theater is coming to America, and I'm with the Director General, Lena Cranlin. Lena, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. So talk to me about this new production, Enemies, A Love Story, and bringing it to New York. It's a uh, really new production. F I mean, for us, it's not new because we have it in our repertoire for two years. Mm -hmm. But during two years, this production uh, was in Colombia, St. Petersburg, uh, other countries, and uh, it was um, accepted extremely well. Mm -hmm. So we hope that in New York, our people, because uh, you know, in New York people, they know who is Bashar Zinger, they know what is the story of enemy's love story, mm -hmm. they know the film probably, they know that it's the story of Holocaust survivors, after the Second World War, they came to America from Europe. But it's not the story of, about Holocaust. It's a story about people, and it's actually a love story mm -hmm. about one man and three women. And uh, you know, the story about one man running between three women, I, I think everybody can, <laughs> can understand what it's about. So the show has already had um, a very international run. What seems to be the message of this play that is um, accepted by you know all countries and all nationalities. You know, it's accepted in all every country. It accepted differently. For example, in Col in Colombia, it was funny for people. Why? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> in Saint Petersburg, it was strange. In China, in China, we've been in China with this show, and Chinese people they accept accepted it extremely well mm -hmm. and like we thought what is the common between Jews of the Holocaust mm -hmm. and Chinese people they invited us again after this mm -hmm. 
So uh, I don't know. I hope in America it will be the the easiest exception of this story because it's the closest. Thank you, Meredith. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.